We're live, everyone. Hello, everybody in the audience. Welcome to PNC Live. My name is Beth, and I work in events for Politics and Codes. We thank you so much for joining us in this new format, where we continue to bring the authors we love and their new books to the PNP community. At any time during the event tonight, you can click on that big green button below to purchase tonight's book on the PNP website. We're currently offering reduced rates on shipping as an incentive, especially as our physical stores are closed and we need your online purchases in order to keep bringing you the programming PNP is known for. We know that everybody is here tonight because they purchased a ticket and we thank you so much for that, um, purchasing a book as, as your ticket um, in tonight. Tonight, you can ask our author a question by clicking on ask a question found near the bottom of your screen. You can also read other people's questions and even vote for ones you'd like to hear answered the most. Um, a reminder that unlike our in-person events, the author, hosts, and audience members cannot see you through the screen. So we welcome you tonight, even in your pajamas. On to the main event. Dr. Vivek Murthy served as the 19th Surgeon General of the United States from 2014 to 2017 and is the author of tonight's book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. He's been busy even since releasing the book, providing counsel to presidential candidate Joe Biden's campaign on COVID-19 and what citizens can do to limit its spread. I'm so sorry, this is, this is, Mar this is the interpreter. Yeah. Um, it is breaking up because you're speaking so quickly. Could oh, you please I'm sorry. Down? Yes, definitely. Thank you, and just start again with um, Dr. Murthy's um, bio. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy served as the 19th Surgeon General of the United States from 2014 to 2017 and is the author of tonight's book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. He's been busy even since releasing the book, providing counsel to presidential candidate Joe Biden's campaign on COVID-19 and what citizens can do to limit its spread. Dr. Murthy is joined in conversation tonight by Sarah Hurwitz, senior speechwriter for President Barack Obama, as well as former head speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. Her book here all along was, reached in, uh, was released in 2019. Uh, interpreting services tonight are provided by Mary Beth Morgan of uh, Joyful Signing. Uh, we welcome Vivek and Sarah. Thank you so much, Beth. It is such a joy to be here with my dear friend, Vivek Murthy, someone who I admire so greatly. This is a joy, and especially to talk about this book, which is by far one of the most important books I've read in a very long time. It totally changed my understanding of loneliness, and it was just personally meaningful as well as just really enlightening. So I'm thrilled to be here, Vivek. So thank you, Vic Sarah, for being here and <laughs> in, indulging me in this way as my dear friend. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> so you were the Surgeon General of the United States of America. And after the Obama administration ended, you could have written some kind of memoir or tell all or leadership book that would have been, you know, sold at airports everywhere. But instead, you decided to write a book about loneliness arguing that it's a really serious problem here in America and around the world. Now, why did you decide to write this book and, and what makes it such a serious problem? Well, first, let me just say how wonderful it is to be here uh, and to finally be sharing this, this book with the world and to be doing so in conversation with uh, a dear friend who I deeply admire. And if anyone was gonna write a tell-all from their years in the Obama administration, it's more likely to be you, Sarah, because I'm not sure I had that many juicy secrets to share anyway, so <laughs> that wasn't really an option for me. <laughs> but I will say that this is not the book I thought I would write. I did have some uh, ideas about books I did want to write coming out of office. I thought maybe I would do something on sort of a new view of public health that I had and what we needed to do as a country to rebuild our public health infrastructure. I thought maybe I would write about my time in office and what I learned about government. But then what happened is, is sometimes, you know, you can have the best big plans and then the universe takes you in a different direction. And that's what happened to me. So in 2017, I wrote this article for Harvard Business Review on loneliness in the workplace. I wrote it because the editors asked me to. I wasn't entirely sure how interested business readers would be in a topic like loneliness. But what I found in the days and weeks that followed the publication of that article is I was getting so many messages from around the world. Some of them were from media uh, folks who said, hey, we think this is a real problem in our country. And those messages would come from all over the United States, from India, from Japan, from South Korea, from countries across Europe and Latin America. 
But then I got a whole bunch of other types of messages from individuals who said, you know, I've been struggling with loneliness for a long time, or my spouse has been, and I, I didn't realize that it was so common. I didn't realize that maybe I don't need to be ashamed of it. And that was really striking to me. Uh, and long story short, after that, what ended up happening is it came, became clear, you know, through that experience and the, the suggestions and advice of, of good friends and confidants that this was actually the issue that was not only important to write about, but I realized the more I talked about it, the more it was important to me and it was resonating with my own lived experiences as a child and then later as a doctor. So that's what led me to, to ultimately focus on this topic. As, as I talk about in the early stages of the book, when when I traveled around the country as Surgeon General and met people in small towns and big cities everywhere, I heard stories that were not surprising, stories about people's struggles with substance use disorders and addiction. I heard about parents who had lost you know, their own children to overdoses from opioids, which is an experience no parent should ever have to go through, but so many were. I heard about parents who were worried about the depression and anxiety uh, that seemed to be rising among you know, kids and, and other, you know, children in their generation. But what I started to see behind these stories was a deeper threat of loneliness. And here's how it presented. It wasn't somebody coming up and saying, hi, my name is Jack. I'm struggling with loneliness. People would say things like this. They would say, you know, I feel like we have to deal with all of these problems and I feel like I have to do it all on my own. But they would say, I feel like if I disappeared tomorrow, nobody would even notice. Or they would say, I feel absolutely invisible. And time after time hearing that, it started to register for me that there was something bigger going on here. It reminded me of my experiences in the hospital, whereas from the earliest days of doctoring, I remember seeing so many patients who would come in and would have nobody with them. And sometimes when we had a really important diagnosis that we had made, or we had to make a really big decision about treatment, I would ask them, who could I call so that we could have a family conversation? Because these are really tough issues to deal with by oneself. And so often I would get the answer that there was nobody to call. And even at the last stages of life, in those final days and hours where I was privileged to sit uh, with people and to, to be witness uh, to their final moments, a lot of times it was just me and my colleagues in the hospital who were those witnesses, and there was nobody else uh, who was there. And so I was, I was reminded of those experiences of when I was traveling the country as Surgeon General. And the more I looked into it, I realized that loneliness is both more common uh, and more consequential in terms of its impact on our health than I had even realized. Mm. That's, and so, you know, it sounds like you were, you were really seeing loneliness in, in many different populations, not just, you know, we typically think of the elderly as, as being lonely, but I'm hearing you say, actually, no, it was, it was affecting people of all ages and backgrounds. Is that the case? Absolutely, uh, Sarah. And I found actually when I even traveled abroad and, and talked to people in England and in other countries, what I found is that most people had this notion, this assumption that it was the elderly that struggled with loneliness. And the reasons they believed that was the case is they thought, well, you know, as we get older, sometimes, you know, we are more limited in our ability to go out, perhaps by illness or disability. Maybe we're also, we have the experience of losing close family and friends as we get older and others get ill, and we are, aren't able to connect with people as well. And all of that is true. But what I found out really interestingly was that loneliness was affecting people across the age span. Uh, and it had a particular spike, in fact, among young people, among mm -hmm. folks who count themselves as members of Gen Z or millennial, the millennial generation. What I also found interestingly was that it seemed to be the great equalizer, in a sense. Like, I found that whether you were rich or poor, I was hearing stories of loneliness, whether people lived in urban areas or in rural areas. When I traveled to fishing villages in Alaska and heard stories about loneliness, I visited members of Congress in Washington, D.C., who would tell me in hushed tones behind closed doors that they were struggling with loneliness, and they knew that many of their peers in Congress were too. Moms and dads, you know, people who were rich and poor, everybody seemed to have an experience to share, or they knew somebody in their life who was struggling with loneliness. And that's what made me realize that there's something different going on here. You know, in D.C. these days, you can't find too many issues that both parties seem to agree on and come together on. That's something that you've lived uh, for and Sarah, and you know that. Um, but I found, interestingly enough, in as polarized an environment as we're living in, that 
in talking about the subject of loneliness and social connection, it felt like it resonated with everybody. And I would say that there was no topic, including the opioid epidemic, that I touched on during my tenure that seemed to strike a chord within people as deeply as the subject of loneliness did. And it's interesting in terms of the effects of it, you know, it seems like, yes, there are mental health effects, but I was struck in your book by how you talk about how loneliness has actual physical health effects. In fact, at one point you mentioned it was the equivalent of smoking a certain number of cigarettes a day. I forget the statistic, but it was really shocking. Well, this is something that was surprising to me as well. Uh, I learned uh, through the conversations with uh, people that I had and also through the research I did afterward that loneliness is more than a bad feeling. It has deep consequences for our mental and physical health. It turns out it has major consequences outside of our health as well, impacting how we perform in the workplace, how our kids show up and perform in school. And it even, as everything we'll talk about later in this conversation, I think has serious contributions to the polarization that we're experiencing today in our politics and our difficulty having dialogue in society. But to come back to the health piece for a moment, what the studies seem to show us is that there is a strong association between loneliness and the risk of heart disease and dementia and depression and anxiety. People who struggle with loneliness have more fragmented sleep. So they may sleep for the same number of hours, but the quality and restfulness of that sleep is impaired. And now, given everything we are learning about the importance of sleep for our overall health, for the, the increased risk, for example, of obesity that people have who don't sleep enough, we're realizing that sleep is really important. And so the impacts of loneliness on sleep are, are quite profound. But perhaps most striking in what, what you referenced, Sarah, was uh, the study done by Julianne Holt Lundstedt from Brigham Young University, uh, a meta-analysis which showed that the association between loneliness and longevity is actually quite, quite interesting, and that the mortality impact or the degree to which one's life is shortened uh, when you struggle with loneliness seems to be similar to the mortality impact of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It seems to be greater than the mortality impact of obesity and sedentary living. And I say this as someone who served as Surgeon General in an office that has, that has spent decades working on smoking, obesity, and physical activity, but not, hasn't, hasn't really focused on the issue of loneliness and social connection because we never, I think, fully appreciated just how powerful an impact it had on our health. Mm, that is extraordinary. Wow. Sobering. Um, you know, just stepping back for just very quickly, you know, when we talk about when you say loneliness, I, I just want to quickly def define, you know, what do you mean? Because in your book, you distinguish between loneliness and solitude. Is loneliness just being alone or is there something there's something more to it than that? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. So loneliness is a subjective term. And so it's determined by how we feel about the quality of our connections. And I would say if you had to define it further, you could say that loneliness is a gap between the social connections we feel that we need and the ones that we have in our life. And that gap is where we experience loneliness. Now, a couple of things that are important to say about this, though, is that you know loneliness has a really unfortunate stigma around it. Uh, many people feel that to admit you're lonely is to admit that you are not likable or that mm -hmm. somehow you're socially deficient or broken in some way. Uh, I say that not just as a theoretical uh, point. I say that from practical experience, from personal experience, because in my own struggles with loneliness, particularly as a child, that's how I felt. That's why I never talked to my family about loneliness. Um, you know, I, I felt deeply loved when I was at home. I was blessed and am blessed to have uh, my mother and a father and a sister who deeply loved me, and I knew that from uh, the, uh, my youngest memories. And so I always felt secure uh, and loved at home. But that sense of belonging evaporated when I walked into school in the morning. And I felt a sinking pit in my stomach you know, each day when my mom's car pulled up uh, in front of school to drop me off. Uh, I was scared about those moments on the playground when everyone would be picked for a team. And I worried about being the last one picked, even though I actually had pretty good athletic ability. I worried about, most of all, about lunchtime, about walking into the cafeteria and not knowing if there would be somebody to sit next to or somebody would make room for me. And I just couldn't wait until 3 p.m. when the bell rang in elementary school to find my parents and to go back home to an environment where I felt secure. And so I know from firsthand experience that the, the shame that comes with loneliness is profound. 
And it keeps us not only from admitting to ourselves what is happening, but it makes us feel that we're alone because everyone else around us is hiding uh, their loneliness. But the reason I, I bring this up is because I think there's an important reason for us to, to understand that loneliness is actually not something to be shameful, but is in fact a natural signal that our body sends us. Uh, so just like we experience hunger or thirst when we're lacking something we need for survival, when we lack social connection, something that we actually do deeply need sur for survival that evolution has led us to, we actually feel a similar signal and that signal is loneliness. And if we respond to that signal by seeking out uh, meaningful connection in our life, by calling a parent or a dear friend, by going to visit uh, somebody whose company we enjoy, then those feelings of loneliness may subside. Uh, but if that loneliness persists for long periods of time, then we can start to see and run into the health consequences uh, that we're talking about. And a very interesting uh, thing happens actually when loneliness is chronic, which is we start to develop these patterns which actually can take us even deeper into loneliness. So when we, when we experience loneliness, what's happening is that from an evolutionary perspective, we are, we are wired to actually feel like we're in a state of threat and danger when we're lonely. And the reason has to do with how we evolved over the thousands of years. So when we were hunter-gatherers wandering the tundra, safety really did depend on numbers. And if we were together in trusted relationships, then there was a greater chance that we could take turns watching out for predators, that we could share our food supply and ensure we didn't starve. Mm. But when we became separated from our tribe, our chances of survival automatically dropped. And that became baked into our nervous system. So we perceived separation and loneliness as a stress thing. Uh, and we experience it with elevated threat levels, with an increased focus on ourselves because we're worried about safety. Now that makes sense in that evolutionary context, but transport that to the modern world, right? And think about what happens in the modern world where you are feeling chronically lonely and that's accompanied by an elevated threat level where you're more suspicious of people and developments around you, where you're more centered on self. And you can start to see how it can actually make it harder to connect with people when you're in that mindset. When you combine that, Combine that with the fact that chronic loneliness chips away at our self-esteem and starts to convince us that maybe we're lonely because we're not likable and it makes it even harder for people to venture out. And so in a paradoxical sense, you find that when you're chronically lonely, you can withdraw further and further into your shell just when you need to be reaching out. That's one of the reasons that loneliness is so insidious but can be so persistent unless we understand how to approach it correctly. Mm, that is, I mean, that just, that's, that's sort of heartbreaking to think about this spiral where loneliness leads to deeper loneliness, which leads to deeper loneliness. I mean, that's a very, seems like a very painful place to be. Um, just stepping back for a minute, you know, what are some of the historical trends and the societal trends that have led to the rise in loneliness? And I'm, I'm particularly interested in the role of the internet and social media in not just causing loneliness, but possibly alleviating loneliness. Like, wh which is it? Are, is that you know, is that stuff responsible for loneliness? Do people feel less lonely? You know, what's the role of that, you know, in these broader societal trends that we're seeing? It's a really good question. And let me just say also just from the outset that when you hear the topic loneliness, you might think, wow, this sounds like a real downer. But I'll tell you that my experience talking to people about this subject and studying it over the last few years has actually led me to feel deeply inspired and hopeful because this story about loneliness is partly about loneliness, but it's also about the opposite of loneliness, which is about the extraordinary power of human connection and the power of that connection to heal not only our bodies and our minds, but to heal the broader society in which we live. And it was those stories and the hope that emanated from those that made me realize that we have at our fingertips the ability to build the kind of world that can not only sustain us in a deeper and more fulfilling way, but that can also support our children in the ways that we hope uh, they can live. And so uh, I know we'll talk more about that, but I wanna mention that because it's really important to recognize that out of the challenge of loneliness comes, I think, a discovery around a deeper resource we have that can be deeply, deeply sustaining. But where did this all come from? So it turns out that loneliness is on you. Uh, it didn't just happen when the internet started, uh, but people have been lonely for generations and generations. Uh, you know, we haven't written about it for the longest of times, but it seems that Shakespeare was one of the early people actually to start writing about it, at least in Western literature. And what's driving is probably several factors. You know, there's 
certainly a mobility factor where we are more mobile than ever. That's amazing because it creates opportunity for us, for us. It also means that we move away from communities that, we, uh, that we've come to know over time, and that can be hard. Uh, the other challenge uh, is, uh, is a cultural challenge, which I think is one of the most insidious and, and most difficult to address, which is that even though if I went out onto a street corner and asked 10 people, what's your number one priority in life? I almost guarantee you that they would say a person or a group of people, their kids, their spouse, et cetera. But even though they would say that, even though I would say that, if you look at how we actually live our lives as judged by where we put our time, our attention, and our energy, for many of us, and certainly this has been the case for me over the last many years, that focus is not actually on those people. It's more so on work or on other priorities. And partly it's not, we don't do this because we're bad people or because we don't value human relationships. We do this in part because we live in a culture that tells us that success is defined in a particular way. And it's defined not by your ability to build positive relationships and nurture them over time. It's defined by your ability to acquire one of three things, wealth, power, or reputation. So if I build a company, sell it, and make a lot of money, I'm called successful in the media. If I have lots and lots of followers on social media and I seem to have people around me all the time, people think I'm popular. If I'm well known, then people think, wow, I really made it. You know, I'm famous. I've made a name for myself. You hear that term all the time. Right. And if I acquire a position of power, if I become president of the United States, CEO of my company, a manager in my organization, the principal of my school, and people say, wow, you know, he's really made it you know, because he's achieved a position of power. The thing is, when you talk to people who have achieved in all these three areas or any one of them, what they'll almost uniformly say is that the pursuit of that goal contrasted with how they felt when after they achieved it, which is they mm -hmm. felt the moment of exhilaration, but not the lasting fulfillment and happiness uh, that they wished they had had. And so the a culture that leads us to prioritize and define success in a way that's different and I think separate from human relationships is one that I think ultimately leads us to focus on things that separate us and that ultimately lead us to deprioritize human relationships in our life. But finally, let me talk about tech since you brought that up. Yeah. You know, technology is the single most common question I get asked about with loneliness. Uh, parents in particular who see their kids on devices all the time and often alone in their rooms on evenings and weekends want to know, is this hurting my child? Is it making my child more lonely? And these are really important questions to ask. And I will say that my belief about technology from everything I have seen, read, and understood now, is that technology itself is, is a tool. And the question is, how do we use it? And we can use technology in ways that actually strengthen our connections. So for example, if we live far away from a relative but, and we can't go and travel and see them often, but we can uh, FaceTime with them on a regular basis, then that can actually be uh, a, a pro-social experience that can help strengthen our connection with them. If we also, uh, use technology to connect with people offline, that can be powerful too. So if I'm coming to Miami, Florida, for example, and I post on Facebook, hey, I'm coming to Miami, uh, are any of my friends uh, free to hang out or to catch uh, lunch or dinner? And then we actually meet up. That can actually be a great way uh, of staying connected with friends. And if you're also, you know, if you also find yourself, you know, as a member of a community, uh, of which there aren't many people like you around, if you find that you're from your race or ethnicity and that you happen to be a rare bird you know in your community if you find uh, that you're gay for example and there aren't many gay people around you and you don't have a community then online platforms can be extraordinarily powerful to helping people um, connect with others who have shared experiences so in all those ways tech can be helpful but what i worry about with technology is i think the predominant way we're using technology now is actually in a way that i think further disconnects us and i think because what's happening with our use of technology now is number one, the time that we spend on social media, on our email, on our devices is actually taking away from the time that we would normally spend with somebody in person. So there's a, uh, there's a detraction there because we only have 24 hours in the day. The second thing though, is technology also dilutes the in-person interaction that we have quite often. So how many of us, for example, have had lunch or dinner catching up with a friend at a restaurant and have found that, each of us are actually checking our phones in between or getting distracted when alerts pop up on our phone. 
That certainly happened to me. Uh, but even more, even worse than that, and what I feel even more guilty about is I've had many experiences of talking to friends on the phone, but then finding myself just mindlessly scrolling through my email or through refreshing my social media feed or, or Googling a question that came up. And I don't need to do that. It's just so accessible. It's right there and I just fall into it. But it, it does dilute the quality of our conversation because science tells us very clearly we cannot multitask. What we do when we think we're multitasking is we're actually <laughs> task switching uh, between one thing and another very rapidly. Um, and this is why I think that um, it's so important for us to ask the question now, how do we strengthen not only the quantity of time we have with people, but perhaps even more importantly, the quality of time as judged by the attention and focus that we give another human being. So all this to say, the technology is a mixed bag and it can be used to strengthen or weaken our connections. I worry that how we're using tech now isn't always serving us well. Uh, and particularly when I think about young people, uh, when I think about my kids as they grow up and what they will encounter on social media, I worry about the accelerated culture of comparison that you see propagated on social media, where people are posting about their best days and we're comparing it to our average days and always feeling like we come up short. Uh, and that just is a recipe for chipping away further at one sense of self-worth at one self-esteem, which in turn makes it harder to then connect with others. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, you know, this is now, I've been uh, asked one last question before we open it up to uh, audience question. And this is a question about solutions. You know, I think what I was really particularly moved and really uplifted by in your book is that you detail in just this beautiful, vivid prose, the stories of so many people who are engaging in solutions to loneliness in, here in America and around the world, individuals, schools, communities, cities, states. So I'd love to hear about some of those solutions and particularly ones that could be relevant right now, because obviously we are in, a, in the midst of a pandemic where we're, you know, those of us who are, you know, responsible are, are engaging in pretty serious physical distancing. And there's a line in your book that just really kind of struck me where it said, we're biologically primed, not just to feel better together, but to feel normal together. And I think a lot of us are just feeling not very normal now. So I'd love to hear about some of the solutions that you found, you know, pre-pandemic, but also maybe some of them that could be helpful right now. Yeah, and you know, Sarah, this is one of the most inspiring parts of the book to me, because which is that I got to, I had this incredible privilege of meeting, uh, uh, often virtually and sometimes in person, these extraordinary individuals uh, around the country and around the world who had struggled with loneliness, but had found these extraordinary ways to connect with people, ways that took courage, that took risk, that took initiative, and often took creativity. But, but they were showing me through their lived example that we are not consigned to be lonely, that that does not have to be our destiny, but that we can find ways to build connection in our life and to help others who are struggling find connection as well. I found in the course of, of, of reflecting on these stories that there were a few key uh, principles that came up and, and I wanted to share some of those with you. Uh, principles that I think of as being the bedrock for living a connected life. One has to do with time and specifically with the quantity of time. I think that if we can make sure that we're spending at least some time each day, it could be just be 15 minutes a day, connecting with someone we love, that can be an extraordinary foundation for us. And that can be time spent on video conference. It could be time spent calling a friend to hear their voice. It could be simply writing to somebody that we love to say, hey, I'm just thinking about you. I wanna know how you're doing. That 15 minutes may not seem like a long time, but one of the things I have learned is that a little bit goes a long way when it comes to strengthening our connection that we don't need to quit our jobs and spend all of our time uh, with friends. Although if you can do that, you might really enjoy it. We don't need uh, to necessarily turn our entire life upside down at the moment, but we can start small with 15 minutes and we will feel much more deeply connected. The second thing I learned is that the quality of time really matters. And the way to improve the quality of our time with other people to start is actually to eliminate distraction when we're with others. One of the greatest gifts that we can give someone else is the gift of our full attention. I mention this because in a world where we are so primed to act, to solve problems, ours and other people's, it's easy to forget that simply listening deeply 
and presently uh, can have an, a profound healing effect on other people. If you think back to an experience that you've had where somebody has been fully present with you, or they've listened actively to what you're saying, you know that you have this amazing feeling of being seen in that, in that setting. And you feel like it's an incredibly intimate experience that can all happen without uttering a single word. So by eliminating distraction and giving people the gift of our full attention, by actually being open and sharing and having the courage to be vulnerable in those moments, we can deepen the quality of the interaction we have. And five minutes of high quality interaction can often be much more powerful than 30 minutes of distracted conversation. The third thing that I found helps, and this was a bit of a surprise to me, was that service, it turns out, Service is a powerful antidote to loneliness. And now that you understand a bit of the biology and evolution of loneliness, now that you understand how it has this paradoxical effect of turning our focus inward and chipping away at our self-esteem, you can understand why service helps because it shifts the attention away from us to someone else in the context of a positive interaction. But it also reaffirms to us that we have value to bring to the world in a very, very tangible way that helps build up our own sense of self, it reaffirms uh, who we really are. Uh, you know, and finally, I'll just say that there's a, a really important uh, note here that has to be made about the importance of solitude. That would be the fourth point I would add, uh, which is we don't always think about solitude as being important. And it's important to recognize what's the difference between solitude and being lonely and alone. Well, you may be alone in a state of solitude, but it's a pleasant state. It's a welcome state. It's one where we let the noise around us settle, where we connect more deeply with ourselves, where we center ourselves. And that might be five minutes that you spend on your stoop, feeling the wind against your face. It might be a few minutes that you spend remembering three things you're grateful for. It might be time that you spend at the beginning or end of the day in simple meditation or prayer, or it might be a walk that you take in nature. But those moments of solitude are precious and powerful because it's when we re-anchor ourselves. And when we approach other people from that state of centeredness and peace, we can often have better conversations and enjoy stronger connections with them. So these four I would put together as some of the core principles that I learned from the people that I met everywhere. They're not always easy to do, especially in the busy lives that we lead. But I will say, especially given the state of the world now and how we were struggling uh, with COVID-19, uh, this extraordinary and, and disturbing virus that has forced us to physically distance from each other, it's become more important to build on these principles and to build them into our lives because we may be physically distanced, but we can't allow that to mean that we become socially distanced. And we have an opportunity now to choose between a path of deepening loneliness as we're more distanced from each other, a path that will ultimately lead uh, to a social recession, if you will, or we have the choice of moving in the opposite direction, of using this moment to step back and to reaffirm the importance of connections in our life, to recommit to people and to relationships and to prioritizing uh, those relationships in our life and to actually act on it now by reaching out to people we love in small bits of time with more focus and care. We have the chance to serve the people around us, whether it's a neighbor who might be struggling or a colleague at work who's having a hard time homeschooling their kids and teleworking at the same time. Through these small opportunities, by shifting our perspective now, I believe we can not only deepen the connections that we feel, but we can set ourselves up to be more connected, more fulfilled, and less alone than we were even pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful, what a beautiful sentiment. Uh, I, I also love the term you use, social, the, it was, would you say the social recession, which, you know, it seems like what you're urging to counter that is sort of like when we urge people to go and, you know, get takeout from a small business, you know, support a local bookstore. It's sort of like you're asking people actually think about that socially too. Think about making those investments in, in your, you know, your relationships and your friendships that the, the sort of social economy doesn't go into recession like the economic economy. That's right. Odd phrase, fact, but yeah. Sarah, I, I would say that this is actually, I, I think we can think of this as an opportunity for social revival. Mm. And social revival doesn't mean that we have more parties and large group gatherings necessarily. <laughs> that might be one way uh, that people may enjoy getting together. But whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, 
I believe we all need social connection in our life. And the social revival is one where we reprioritize people in our life. You know, if I had one simple credo coming out of this book, it would be put people first, just mm. those three words. And I realized in my own life that that's what I need to do. It's what I want to do. And it's at the heart of building a people-centered life and a people-centered world. Uh, what I worried about when we first found out that uh, my wife and I were pregnant with our, our first child, Dejas, and what I worried about even when our second uh, child, Shanti, was born, uh, was that I worried, as did Alice, uh, my wife, about the kind of world that they were being brought into. You know, we mm -hmm. read the headlines in the news about violence in communities, about the growing polarization, about the struggles we have with so many issues from climate change to healthcare, and on and on the list goes. And we also were most concerned, though, just about how separated people seem to be, about how mean people seem to be uh, to each other at times. And we wondered, what kind of world are we bringing our child into? And as we thought, as so many parents do, about how it is that we can create a better world uh, for our children and other people's children, we recognized that what we needed to do was to tip the scales in the world toward love and away from fear. Because what we saw was that there was this deep struggle that the world was locked in between these two powerful forces. And we see the forces of love manifest in our life all the time as generosity, as compassion, as kindness. I'm so happy to see so much of that, especially during this time of great trauma with COVID-19. But we also see fear manifest as anxiety, mm -hmm. as anger, as frustration, as insecurity, as jealousy. And that can have a toxic effect on our relationships, on our organizations, and in our politics. And I've come to believe that much of our decisions in life, much of our motivation and what we say, think, and do comes from one of these two sources, from love or fear. Mm -hmm. And the whole reason that Alice and I worked on this book over the last two years is because we saw it as part of our effort, hope to hopefully in a small way, tip the world toward love and to create a kind of world that was fueled by kindness and by compassion, by the very forces that we know our children need to sustain them, that they need to receive from others, that they need to give themselves to the world. But that change will only happen if we make, if we start in our own lives and ask how we can start living more out of love than fear, ask how we can start prioritizing people uh, more and living the people-centered life that I think we all evolve uh, to live. Amen, my friends. Um, so I am gonna turn it to some audience questions that we've gotten. Um, someone asked, does data show that having a wider variety of friends, old, young, black, white, liberal, conservative, is that better than having just friends who are like you? Hmm. That's a great question. Well, I don't know that the data necessarily shows that clearly, but one thing that I think we we are seeing increasingly from a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, is that when you have a diversity of friends uh, in terms of life experiences and points of view, that actually can open your mind up and make you more open uh, to people who may think differently from you in other respects. And so in the current, in, in traditional societies, let's say a hundred years ago, it was easy to live with in a setting where you only associated with people who thought like you. Um, because you could do that, and uh, there wasn't, you know, a wide swath of interaction. People weren't traveling, you know, between countries to the degree they are now, and settling abroad and having diverse communities the way we have here in the United States, in particular. But in 2020, it's much, much harder uh, to avoid diversity, uh, to avoid people who think differently than us or people of other racial, and ethnic, and religious backgrounds. And so, part of what we have to recognize is that in the setting of this type of diversity. Uh, we can go in one of two directions. We can either embrace it with a desire to understand and reflect that in the people we engage with, interact with, and befriend. Or we can seek to cloister ourselves closer and closer just to people who think like us. And the problem with the latter is that because we will always be uh, interacting with people who are different than us just by nature uh, of the way the world works, that if we have not cultivated the ability to understand them, by interacting with them and befriending them, then when we run the risk of feeling more deeply alienated from those around us and, and the, the divide grows. And I think that's what we're seeing in segments of society, which 
uh, have pulled themselves away uh, from folks who are not like them and who feel resentful at times and who feel uh, angry, you know, that, uh, uh, that their way of life is perhaps being changed or that others are diluting their priorities or we, we develop all kinds of narratives when we feel threatened by others. And I think that one of the ways that we have to address this is we have to recognize that uh, while that approach of cloistering ourselves off and looking at others as the other can lead to demonization and can lead to discontent and discord, the way to overcome that is not to throw people in a room together and say, okay, let's all talk about our views on controversial issues and come to some common ground. Uh, and I say this, you know, not in jest, but because this is a common solution I've heard, especially being in DC, is people say, well, what if we got everybody together from different sides of the aisle on gun violence and they could talk out, talk out their views and then we could, you know, come to agreement. But that's not how human beings work. The way we overcome differences is not by talking about issues first, it's by building relationship first. And when we get to know other people as human beings, when we come to understand their experiences, but also find common ground with them, that's how we build relationship. And when we have relationship, we can then deal with challenging controversial issues because we're better able to listen to other people when we have a relationship with them. Just think about the, the you know, the aunt or the uncle who you have over for Thanksgiving dinner periodically, who you have vastly different views with, with on politics or perhaps other issues. Uh, you may not at all agree uh, on those topics, but you still love them. You're perhaps more willing to listen to them than you are a random stranger on the internet who's of an opposing point of view. And that's because our relationship gives us the capacity to listen. And our ability to listen is at the heart of our ability to work through big problems and solve big challenges like climate change or healthcare together. Right. Great. Um, we've got two questions that are both about the role of physicians. So I'm going to kind of combine them. You know, one is one says, given the dire health consequences, do you believe physicians should be screening patients for loneliness or a lack of social connection with the hope of mitigating these risks? And another question is, it says, you talked about how many of the stories you heard reminded you of times in a hospital in a patient's final days, understanding the consequences to health that loneliness can have. What are your major takeaways from this as a physician? And what would you do to recommend, and what would you recommend health professionals do to help with this? So this is a question about the role of health prevent professionals in screening and dealing with loneliness. Yeah, it's a really important question. And, and it's a very personal one to me because obviously this is the position that I found myself in. Look, I think it's exceedingly important that doctors and nurses and others who are in the front lines of healthcare recognize loneliness and its consequences. It's important that we have the ability to screen for it, to know that it's at play, impacting the, the care that we're giving somebody and their ability uh, to engage uh, with the care that we're seeking to provide. And so in medical school, we receive very little training on that, uh, but mm -hmm. I think we need to. Now there's an important caveat here. Is it the responsibility of a doctor to identify, treat and solve loneliness? I don't think that that's a, a responsibility we can place on nurses and doctors alone. Uh, I think all of us need to be better at recognizing loneliness around us, recognizing that it doesn't always look like a person sitting in the corner of a room alone. It can look like anger and frustration and irritability. It can look like depression. It can look like anxiety. Loneliness is a great masquerader that can look like lots of things. But I think what we can do in healthcare once we identify it is we can think about how we can connect people to the right resources in their community where they can help build stronger connection. Uh, there's a movement called social prescribing, which uh, has been uh, certainly growing in England and in increasingly in other countries, where doctors and hospitals are partnering with community organizations to be able to identify people who are lonely in a clinical setting, but then connect them to the community resources where community can really be built. And I'll lastly say that there's tremendous value uh, to being able to just surface the conversation about loneliness between a healthcare practitioner uh, and a patient. Um, there are many times where, uh, you know, I'll admit I didn't know how to talk about loneliness with my patients early in my career because I wasn't trained to do that. I didn't, hadn't thought through it enough. And I feel bad about those moments because I wish I could have done more uh, to help the people struggling uh, in front of me. 
But I think that when you when you train clinicians uh, in how to understand loneliness and talk about it, that even surfacing that with the patient can be extraordinarily powerful and even transformative. Yeah, you know, there's a question here about how do you communicate about loneliness as a writer. Um, you know, this, the questioner writes, many are skeptical when learning about, quote, the softer side of health, i.e. mental health. It can be difficult to convey the importance of deleterious things like loneliness or beneficial things like gratitude. As a science writer, I'm curious about what techniques you use to get past that skepticism and the mental health stigma. Well, it's, it's a really important question. And, and you're right that if you can't get people to take it seriously, then it's hard to, to get people to engage on it. This is frankly part of the reason I wrote this book is because I believe that this is a really important issue that we had to take seriously. Uh, and I wanted to apply uh, the public health and medical vantage points that I had to really looking at this, not as just an issue that makes you feel bad, but as one that has profound consequences for health and society. I think part of the way that we can get people to take this seriously is, is to help root it in our own lived experience. Uh, many people who may, you may sort of downplay loneliness or are doing so not because they've never experienced it, but just because society around them tells them that, hey, this is not uh, something that's important. That's a very different situation from having to talk to or convince somebody who's never experienced loneliness. And I'll tell you from real experience that when I've spoken to people about it who have been skeptical about loneliness and then we've talked about shared experiences and they've gotten how important it is, then you make that emotional connection and then you back that up with the data and the science that shows that it's consequential. And people almost feel like they have permission to recognize that this is important, to even validate their own experiences. Um, I would lastly say that sharing our own experiences can be extraordinarily powerful, uh, not just for us, but empowering to other people. We've seen this when it comes to the substance use uh, uh, disorder work and to the larger movement around recovery and addressing addiction that part of what has helped power that movement has been people coming forward, sharing their stories, making the case that addiction is not a character flaw, but it's a real condition that we need to address uh, with seriousness, with urgency, with compassion. Uh, and I think the same is true here. Uh, listen, when I think about those patients who I saw in the final moments of their life, when I think about the conversations that we had, ones I was privileged uh, to participate in when I would hold their hands sitting at the bedside. I think about what they talked about. What they talked about was not the promotions they had received or the amount that they had in their trust fund or their bank account. They didn't talk about how many followers they had on social media or how many media profiles were written about them. What people talked about in their final moments of life were relationships people they loved, the ones they wish they had spent more time with, the ones that broke their heart. Those final moments of life are deeply clarifying. They give us a clue as to what's truly important to us. But one of my great realizations coming out of writing this book was that we don't need to wait until the end of life to realize what really matters, that it's actually right there in front of us asking to be embraced and those are the people around us, the relationships that we often have that perhaps have forgotten or deprioritized, the people who need us just as much as we need them. And if we can focus on the human part of connection, the common need that we all feel, then not only I think can we find that we can build a community that values and prioritizes connection, but I think we can create the social revival that we need not just in the United States, but really all over the world. Hmm. Amen to that too, my friend. Um, I So we're gonna do two more questions. The first one is actually, I'm gonna combine two questions because there are two questions about children and early life. So one is, I'm a middle school teacher and I've definitely noticed that my students seem lonely in our distance learning environment. What words do you use when talking with children about loneliness? And then the second one is, I'm struck, by the, I'm struck by the potential connection to ACEs screenings. That's an acronym for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Do you see a connection between loneliness and early life trauma? Thoughts about teaching how people how to connect to others. So both about childhood and, and childhood experiences and, and trauma and loneliness. 
This is such a beautiful question. And as a, as a dad, this really resonates with me. I think it's really important that we are able to have conversations with our kids about topics like loneliness. I would say more broadly, it's important to, for us to be able to converse with children about emotions. And one of the people who has inspired me on this subject has been Mark Brackett from Yale, who has uh, really devoted himself to building a uh, social and emotional learning curricula, uh, uh, in fact, a particular program uh, you know, that he developed at Yale, which is, is really designed to help kids build emotional literacy and be comfortable, not just talking about emotions, but recognizing what they're feeling. And I think that this starts often very powerfully just by example, by kids seeing how their teachers and their parents and the adults around them talk about emotions. Uh, when you talk about feeling sad and say that, you know what, it's okay, we all feel sad sometimes. This is what it feels like for me. It gives a child tacit permission to think about sadness, to talk about sadness, to experience sadness. And the same is true for loneliness. Uh, if we can talk about our own experiences with it and normalize it, it can encourage a child to also feel that way. I mean, to, to, to be give, give them permission, in fact, to talk about it as well. I think it's important with kids that we, that we make it clear that being lonely is not a sign that you're broken or that you're deficient in some way. It's important to normalize it and say that everybody at some point in their life experiences loneliness. We may show it in different ways, and, but it's invisible a lot of the time. We can't always see it in other people. That doesn't mean it's not there. And so I think that's really important for kids. I think when it comes to trauma, especially, you know, one of the things that I was really struck by was this uh, a study that was done in Hawaii and that I write about in the book, uh, a study that looked at children who had actually experienced trauma. And in this study, what they found, and it was a wonderful study that followed kids actually for several decades, but they found that children who had experienced trauma were able to to find strong social connections in their life had far fewer of the negative after effects of trauma than children who did not have those relationships. And, you know, I've talked to people who have studied and worked on ACEs for years and years and years. And one of the common themes that comes up in these conversations is that as powerful as ACEs are, these adverse childhood experiences, this trauma in kids' lives, as deep as the wounds may go and as harsh as they may be in increasing their risk for everything from addiction uh, to lung disease to early mortality, it turns out that one of the most powerful medicines that we have is in fact social connection. It's a love that comes through our relationships that can be deeply healing. You know, I, I, I say this word love very intentionally and purposefully because I think it's important that we talk about love. I don't think we talk enough about it. Love is not just a feeling. It's a force. I, as a doctor, have written prescriptions for many medications over the years, but there's nothing that I have prescribed that is more powerful than the healing potential of love. And that's why as we go about our days, as we think about how we wanna reconfigure and rebuild our lives, as we look at the loneliness that may be around us, it's important to recognize that you don't need a medical degree or a nursing degree to heal what ails around you and to help people feel more connected. What you need is a willingness to show up in people's lives with a full heart, with compassion, and with a desire to both give and receive love. That is how we ultimately address loneliness. That's how we build a more connected world. Mm, yes, it's beautiful. Um, so we have a final question, which is sort of interesting in, in light of what the UK has done in establishing actually a, a ministry of, of loneliness. The question is, does loneliness need a public policy solution? Do we need a social stimulus plan? So I think while we've talked about various, you know, state, community, school levels, you know, do we actually need a national public policy coordinated approach to loneliness? Well, that's a really interesting question. And what I would say is that there is a very important role uh, for government to play here recognizing that it's not the responsibility of any one entity to solve loneliness. This is a shared problem that requires all of us to step up, individuals, organizations, professions, as well as the public sector, the government. But what government can do, which is extraordinarily powerful, is number one, it can invest real resources in research and helping us understand the drivers and solutions to loneliness. The second thing government can do is it can help prioritize issues. 
when the government states that a certain issue is a crisis, uh, as we did uh, when I was Surgeon General around the opioid epidemic, uh, that's really important to do because you can actually help convene and bring people together uh, to fashion solutions, but you can really make it a point that this is a public health priority. Perhaps a third thing uh, that government can do is they can examine more deeply the impact of its policies on social connection. We now understand, uh, which we weren't able to appreciate as much 30, 40 years ago, that the policies that have an impact on health are not just healthcare policy, but transportation policy and housing policy end up having impacts on health. Education policy has an impact on health because what happens in schools actually impacts the physical and mental health of our children. In similar ways, I think if we look closely at it, we will recognize that education, housing, transportation policies are policies in the Department of Defense as well, uh, which I say having spoken to many of our uh, wonderful servant, uh, you know, military servants there. These policies, they have an impact on our social connection. When we cut cities up uh, with highways and divide up neighborhoods, it makes it harder for people to connect with each other. When we build a culture that's powered by cars increasingly, such that people don't walk anywhere and run into each other, then that impacts our social connection. When we push schools to focus almost exclusively on testing for math and English and science, but pay little attention to prioritizing their social and emotional learning, that has an impact on relationships. So in all of these ways, government can have a really profound impact on how we prioritize loneliness, how we understand the impact of policy and how we drive solutions by bringing various aspects uh, of the community together. Look, I know that our time has, has come to uh, a close and I just want to say that, um, you know, as this is a very special experience for me being here with all of you, um, uh, both because I'm doing this with a dear friend and Sarah, but also because this is one of the first events that we're doing with a bookstore to bring the book uh, to the world. And I want to say that in particular, I want to pay um, to real tribute to, uh, to my family, you know, to my wife, Alice, to my mother, to my father, to my sister, Rashmi, to my brother-in-law, Ahmed, and to my grandmother, uh, Sarojini, all of whom have been just extraordinarily powerful supports, but also teachers. You know, when I ended the book, when I wrote the final pages of the conclusion, uh, the story that I wrote was about my parents and my sister. Uh, it was a story about their patient, uh, the patient that my mother and father cared for in their medical clinic named Gordon, a patient who passed away after a very difficult struggle with metastatic cancer. And when he passed away in the middle of the night, my parents woke me up and my sister up. It must have been two in the morning. And they piled us into the car and we drove to this trailer park in Miami where we were going to visit his widow, Ruth because my parents were worried that they were grieving alone, that she was grieving alone. And that they were doing that not because it was in their job description as doctors uh, and as, you know, as my mom, you know, being the manager of the office, they weren't doing that because they were getting reimbursed for it by an insurance company. They were doing it because they saw that as their responsibility as a member of the community, as somebody who had a relationship with this wonderful family that was going through a hard time. And, you know, to this day, I will never forget that image of my mother in her traditional Indian sari, walking up the steps of Ruth's trailer and embracing her. I remember the tears flowing down Ruth's face. And I remember staring at that scene and just thinking how different they were. My mother having grown up uh, in India, Ruth having grown up here in the United States with such vastly different life experiences. But in that moment, I realized now that they were so deeply connected. They were family, not the kind that you're born into, but the kind that you choose for yourself. And I ended with that story because I realized that throughout the whole writing of this book, that that story and the other stories that my parents have not just told, but lived for me about human connection, they've demonstrated through example, those stories have been my guide. They've reminded me that our connection to each other is at the heart of who we are as human beings. It's how we experience joy. It's where we find support. It's what gives meaning ultimately to our lives. And so I wanna end with that tribute to them 
because uh, nobody has taught me more, given me more, or meant more to me than the family uh, that I just named. And I feel so deeply grateful to be able to share this book and all the lessons that we learned, but it wouldn't have been possible at all without their example and their encouragement. Well, knowing you, Vivek, I can say the apple did not fall far from the trees. So they obviously, um, they had a huge impact and I, I see it. I see it as your friend. So thank you so much for, for this just beautiful evening. This was really, I think, what we all needed at this time. I absolutely agree. Um, this was a total balm and um, I, I'm, I'm so proud to have been, um, been watching along with you. Thank you so much, both of you, for that um, really, really beautiful, profound, very timely um, discussion. Um, th yeah, thank you guys. And thank you everybody in the audience for being with us here tonight. Um, your patronage, your attendance, and um, kind of most importantly, your book sales are what enable or enables us to, to bring you this kind of programming. Um, Politics and Prose, we pride ourselves. We love hosting these kinds of events. Um, but we, we really can't without the book sales to support them. So we so appreciate you all purchasing a book tonight and coming out. Um, uh, we, we encourage you to, to keep supporting the authors you love, keep supporting your independent bookstores. Um, uh, you can follow Politics and Prose on Crowdcast up at the top of your screen. You can hit that follow button and be notified of our future uh, Crowdcast on the same platform. We've got a really great um, program of events uh, set up for the rest of the month um, and and going into May as well. Um, so uh, kind of as a wrap up, I'm wondering, um, Dr. Murthy and um, Sarah, what are you guys reading um, during this time? Is there anything you're turning to? <laughs> Sarah, you go first. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Not not a whole lot. I would say Twitter, um, The New Yorker, shorter things. I just bought Rachel Kadish's book, The Weight of Ink. It's like 600 pages long. And it's I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I just, I need a little, need a little time. Totally. Little time. <laughs> and, you know, similarly, I'm not reading adult books. I'm reading a lot of Dr. Seuss and other kids' books as I try to entertain my three and two year old uh, at bedtime, when they're on the potty, at meal time, anything I can do to get them to eat. So that's what that's the literature I've been uh, consuming these days. <laughs> Excellent. We love that. Um, and so we we really hope that um, everybody in our audience and everybody, you know, here um, stays well, stay safe um, and stay well read. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank